and now we are recording. All right. <clears throat> uh, so when we begin our work, being that we fight for environmental justice, we feel that it's important uh, to not just acknowledge the land, but to go beyond that, right? Uh, at Chispa, Arizona, we fight for environmental justice. Our di diverse origins reflect the courage and conviction necessary for a transformative environmental advocacy. Our work addresses the reality of colonization brought about by first Spanish conquest, followed by a European invasion in the state of Arizona. These traumatic periods are violent experiences and continue through U.S. institutionalized systems based on genocide, theft, and manipulation that attack indigenous peoples to this day. To be better family members, we humbly acknowledge that we are uninvited guests in stolen and unceded territory. Uh, Chispa's office is located on Atham and Peeposh lands, and the work we do in the state of Arizona uh, is home to 22 federally recognized uh, indigenous nations belonging to the Atham, Peeposh, Yavapai, Hualapai, Havasupai, Apache, uh, Kechan, Yaki, Hopi, Navajo, Pueblo of Zuni, Paiute, Mojave, Cocopa, and the Chimewebes. Uh, to this day, our indigenous uh, relatives protect the sacredness of the land on which we all depend, and we have atten attended the, to this responsibility since time immemorial by utilizing sustainable practices suitable for the lands that make up what we now call, uh, call Arizona. This responsibility, rather than being exclusive to one community, must be practiced among all individuals who occupy stolen territory. Colonization is a daily battle for our indigenous families and relatives, and we at Chispa will work to eradicate contemporary practices that are genocidal and violent and erase uh, our diverse origins. This will ensure that our movement re remains equitable and inclusive. And so with that, and on that note, I'd like to pass it over to our uh, guest speaker uh, tonight, who is Leona Morgan, who is an organizer with the How No campaign. Um, Leona, go ahead and, and take the mic. Thank, thank you. Thanks. Um, did you say hell no? <laughs> did you say hell no? I, I've been struggling with that since the beginning. I keep on wanting to say hell no, but I, I know that's the play on words, so hopefully that's all right. Hell no. Okay. Hell, no. Yeah. Hell, hell no, yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, good evening, everyone. Um, I am working with um, some folks based in Flagstaff, and we're um, fighting this uranium mine. Um, so I'm going to talk with you about that um, tonight. Um, I have a, like a, a few slides to share, and... Um, I'll start first with a quick history. Um, oh, right now, uh, I'm working with Hall No just to give just to give folks some background. I've been doing um, work on fighting uranium mining and other types of nuclear stuff for for a long time. Um, we have um, a lot of a lot of uranium issues in, in New Mexico. So I, I live in Albuquerque. I'm actually a graduate student at UNM. And um, some of the background, uh, my background is is in fighting, um, like I said, uranium mining. Oh, I thought I added a slide. Um, so in Church Rock, New Mexico, there was a proposal for a new mine um, back in 2000. Well, this is an old mine, but I worked on that. So that was an in-situ leach mine. And and we stopped it in 2014, and then that's a longer story. But um, so that's kind of where I got started working on the issue because my family is from Eastern Navajo, so mostly in New Mexico, and that uranium mine would have um, taken uranium out of the ground in Church Rock, and then it would have uh, driven it to the the company would have taken it to Crown Point, New Mexico, where my family lives. And a lot of my relatives um, have been hurt by uranium. So this is how I got involved. And um, most recently, I helped with, with a lot of people across the country. We stopped a nuclear waste dump for, for radioactive waste from power plants. 
Um, so right now, there's nowhere in the country to put waste from nuclear power plants. And I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit later. So that's just a little bit about my, um, my work history. And now um, I'm just going to jump right into this presentation. I think I know. I think I know what happened here. Um, one second. Oh, yeah. I was working on two presentations at the same time. So this is, um, yeah, just some background. Um, I'm going to try to speak slowly for the translation. Um, it's a it's a very simple um, timeline, kind of uh, explaining a little bit about how we are in the situation we are today. So I think all of you know um, we're on stolen lands. So I like to start with the doctrine of discovery. So going back all the way to 1493 um, in the Papal Bulls, back then um, they were basically justifying um, theft and genocide, slavery, um, these types of things. So that was what this doctrine of discovery is about. And and they it's still used today. This is something that is... Um, uh, uh, something they used in, in, in countries in Africa, um, Turtle Island. And so this is the, to me, the beginning of a lot of what we're dealing with in, in, in the Western hemisphere, the global South. Um, so anyways, the doctrine of discovery, um, if you don't know what that is, it's, I think that's, uh, it's a good time to look into that. Um, so moving forward, the founding of the United States, and then these things called federal Indian periods, which were essentially, um, I mean, the first one was removal, you know, to clear the land. Um, and that didn't work. Obviously, a lot of us are still here. Um, and then other tools of colonization include like the railroad. And then and then a huge one is mining. So that's what we're here to talk about tonight. And so through the 1872 mining law, um, a lot of land was stolen through a patent system that didn't require any royalties or, of course, back then there were no environmental laws or standards. So um, the mining law was really to help to move um, the country westward, so manifest destiny and such. And then the General Allotment Act, this was another tool of colonization. This is more relevant probably around Church Rock and Eastern Navajo, um, because it's it's how it's how we have the checkerboard today, which is like just a divide and conquer tactic, really, um, that gave individual heads of households, individual Indians interests. They own interests in land. So it's in some places there's a split estate, but a lot tees, they have the whole they don't own the land or the minerals, but they own the interest in it. So today that results in a lot of a lot of um, wanting to 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 sign leases for like oil and gas and fracking and stuff like that. Back in the day, it was a lot of uranium mining. Um, but today we have a law against uranium mining on the Navajo Nation. I think in the allotments is it hasn't been challenged yet. I wouldn't be surprised if some a tried to challenge it anyways. Um, our Navajo Nation uh, uranium ban, that is, or moratorium, technically it's a moratorium. So moving forward to the 20th century, um, we have the establishment of the Navajo Nation. And really what, what the Navajo Nation was founded for was not because of our sovereignty or our human rights or you know, anything for us really, but it was to sign away oil and gas leases. Um, and, and, you know, today we, we know there's a, there's been a lot of coal, coal mining, uranium mining, and again, the fracking, and then now we're dealing with helium, hydrogen, and probably other stuff I don't have on the list. So a lot of us consider Navajo Nation a resource colony that you know, we're supplying a lot of energy and and things to the outside world when um, a large percentage of our people still don't have running water in the home or 
you know, clean drinking water um, running in the home and then also uh, electricity and things like that. So um, I don't think people are complaining. I don't think anyone's trying to get electricity. I mean, some people are still waiting for water and infrastructure. But anyways, um, so that's just a really quick overview of some of the laws that led to um, how we have a lot of uranium uh, mining in the area. Uh, so, yeah, I was looking for a map uh, when, I, when we were starting of the National Monument, but um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the National Monument. Um, first, I just wanted to, to explain um, abandoned uranium mines. So we call these AUMs. Um, so just a quick history again, going back to the beginning of World War II, when they started to use uranium for um, nuclear weapons. Later, there was a boom of uranium mining between the 50s to the 70s. And a lot of that mining happened before the Environmental Policy, uh, the Environmental Protection Agency. So the US EPA, um, it, it didn't exist. And there was just no laws regulating companies or you know, that required cleanup and, and things like that just didn't exist when the uranium boom was happening. And so we're left with over, um, it's estimated maybe 20,000 abandoned uranium mines and mills um, across the country. About 600,000 abandoned mines of any kind, but uranium specifically, um, we used to say 15,000, but the number has gone up uh, when you add mines and mills. This website, um, uh, it's, a, it's, it's from a 2020 article from Stanford. They put out a number of 23,000 abandoned uranium mines and mills across the country. And we have about, they, the US EPA says 523 on Navajo Nation. Um, people that live there will probably say more. So this map, if you guys can under can can see the lines and can kind of read it, it's a uh, northern Arizona. Here's the four corners, and then here's the Navajo Nation. So you can see there's um, all these clusters. This is a cool map. You can zoom in. Um, it's an interactive map, um, so you can you can look at it and it. It has the mines all across the country. Here is in New Mexico around Mount Taylor. Um, so mining happens a lot of the time on indigenous lands across all over the world. So like Mount Taylor is a sacred place. You know, this is um, one of our sacred mountains and it, it's, it's there's a lot of contamination around here. But anyways, um, so abandoned uranium mines, uh, going back to the history there, they were used the uranium in the beginning was mostly used for weapons, and then not until after the 70s, um, it started going um, for, they started using uranium for nuclear energy. So um, I'm going to fast forward a little bit um, to the Pinyon Plain mine. Um, but before I do that, uh, yeah, I don't have a map. I didn't, I, I'm sorry, I didn't include a map today of the the, the National Monument. But if you can see um, here in this area is, is the Grand Canyon. So we had the Grand Canyon um, National Park and the, the National Monument, it's, it's like in two, two, two chunks and it covers a, m almost a million acres. And this region um, all around the Grand Canyon has a lot of mining claims, just old mining claims um, again, going back to 1872, um, but these are claims that are just uh, like, you know, a, a dirt in the ground. They're not developed, they're not mines. And so just imagine a few thousand dots uh, all, all across this Northern region of undeveloped mining claims. And okay, so I'm gonna go to the, the next slide. So what we're working on is this thing called Pinyon Plain um, uh, uranium mine right here. It used to be called Canyon Mine. Here, here's the National Park again. Um, so, so this is actually inside of the National Monument um, that I mentioned. So back in um, 
August. I mean, it goes back to Obama, uh, the Obama days, but just fast forwarding to August last year, Biden signed a national monument to to protect nearly a million acres from all of those undeveloped um, thousands of uranium claims. But when that happened, there was about 11 of them with valid existing rights um, that were grandfathered in. So this is a loophole that these mines can still go forward, even though the National Monument is, you know, prohibiting new mining. So of those, there's a handful, like probably three that we're really concerned about. One actually started, Pinyon Plain started on January 8th. And so they plan Energy Fuels is the company. They own the mine and they own the mill. Um, and they plan to transport the uranium from the mine south to I-40 and then east and then and then getting off uh, the freeway at Country Club and then driving it um, through the res over to the mill. And this is all U.S. highways. So our tribe, our nation, we have a law against um, uh, uranium mining and we have a law against uranium transport, but um, yeah, we don't have jurisdiction on US highways and there's a lot of other, like just a ton of other challenges in trying to stop radioactive transport. Um, again, going back to the other fight I was in with the uh, high level radioactive waste from nuclear power plants. So in that fight, we were dealing with the transport on the rails, um, but we stopped it, we stopped it. You know, We were able to stop those facilities so I believe we can stop this. You know, we're still trying to figure out how. But um, so anyways, here's the transport route. It's over 300 miles, so a major federal action. Um, they're planning to transport in, in trucks covered only with tarps. And the company's like, oh, well, the tarps are going to be bolted down. You know, the dust is not going to get out. Um, so what Hall No is doing is just just this really right now, lots of education, outreach, um, trying to build awareness. There's different things people can do to get involved or different calls to action that we can talk about later. Um, but yeah, so right now um, it's really challenging to stop it because of 1872 mining law. And then the transport is really challenging to stop. Um, again, I still think we can stop it. Our tribe has a law, uh, like I said, but part of being a sovereign nation um, under the United States federal government um, is submitting to that federal government. So kind of like, you know, in order to have our sovereignty, we're agreeing to those limitations. So that's kind of where we're, where we're at. If the tribe will step outside of that and really challenge it, um, that's that's what we're calling on our president to do. Um, and then also calls to the governor um, and then probably other federal folks later. But that's the issue. Um, there's probably a lot more that goes into it. We can, if you all have some questions, I'm just gonna keep going to the next slide. So yeah, I just wanted to overlay those images to show. I mean, I guess this is where you can connect the EJ impact. So obviously as um, people of color, um, and I mentioned indigenous peoples are impacted by uranium mining more all over the world. It's just, you know, that's just where uranium mining happens to be. If you look at the Hall route, it goes around flag. And then let me just go back real quick. There's this dotted line that goes through private lands. Um, we understand the company doesn't have permission to go through there, but, and we want to keep it that way. So if anyone knows people that have their ranch lands back there, tell them don't sign, <laughs> don't agree to any access agreements um, because you know their private land is gonna get contaminated. We drove on that route, um, it's it's not paved. So the, the road is very washboard, it's very bumpy. Um, yeah, if either, either route, you know, it's gonna affect Navajo. So there's an argument that well, maybe it shouldn't go around Flagstaff because we don't want to expose more people. It's safer if we don't go around Flagstaff, but either way, it's going through Navajo communities. Um, so 
we're, we're, we're screwed either way is what I'm saying. And the first community that it would reach, so here's the route that they, that they have now, and then here's that alternate route. The first community when they get into the Navajo Nation is Cameron. And Cameron has 111 abandoned uranium mines. So about a quarter of all of the abandoned uranium mines on Navajo are here. So, I mean, these people don't want more uranium. They don't want to deal with it. You know, it's just, it's just, you know, a perfect EJ uh, case study. And then, and then it would go around Tuba and then toward up this way through Kienta and then into Utah and then past Bluff and to the mine, I mean, the mill, which is on Ute, in, in the area of the Ute Mountain Ute folks. So yeah, this is the issue. Um, that's the kind of the general story. Our crew is doing monitoring. Um, I like, I used to say we're the only people monitoring, but I heard there's another group out there now, which is good um, to have more eyes on the mine. Back in um, March, 2017, we caught them spraying water, uh, radioactive uranium contaminated water into the forest service land. What happened is they, um, they messed, they, they, they hit an aquifer and there was water getting into the mine. So they were trying to pump it out, but there was too much water on site. So they were trying to get rid of it. And they thought, oh, we'll just evaporate it. And then just, you know, let it get all over the place. Um, and then they couldn't do that. So they were hauling the water in trucks to the mill um, in unmarked vehicles. I mean, vehicles um, marked for something else, not for a radioactive uh hazmat waste and then th so these are from these are from our monitoring this is from march 2017 and um we did we we had some help to submit these um as a report and the arizona department of environmental quality as i understand their response was basically oh okay well thank you for notifying us we'll update their permit so this so they're in compliance kind of thing and so this didn't change anything. I don't think they were ever fined or, you know, nothing, not even a slap on the wrist. And then this is from last Friday. Uh, still, again, um, I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm trying to get dealing with the reporting on this. That's where I'm at is um, these are all kind of new things to deal with. Um, this picture. So this is from, oh, I'm sorry. That one is from last Friday. I'm kind of going out of order, but this this one with the piles is from January 9th. So we took we our team um took pictures. Uh then we got the pictures, and I actually was in Winder Rock, which is our capital for Navajo Nation, and tried to alert the president's uh his staff or administration, somebody. Um, so yeah, I was able to get a hold of the Navajo Nation EPA. Um, somebody, I talked to a bunch of people, but honestly, the tribe, the people I was um, encountering were, were not very receptive. And I don't know, I don't want to get into that, but yeah, there's a lot of problems with ahí, pero es Oh, things like that. So my report to the tribe, my very first very, report, very, report, very, 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 it, 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 it so my very first report to the tribe wasn't well received because of because of like I was mentioning um, issues of misogyny and just bad treatment from our government. So I did get attention from the Navajo EPA director who who has been on top of this I think since then. And so yeah, there's a lot of work. Um, I think the tribe is researching kind of what happened. Not everybody was aware in in high levels of our government people didn't know anything about valid existing rights so i'm i they they, they agree to the national monument thinking it's going to stop all the mining and so some folks were just not educated um i'm not really sure what happened in the end if it was a compromise because you know they stopped thousands of claims and oh what's one or two mines um so this is what's going on um those are some of our group's pictures and I just want to wrap up with a quick um, explanation of why nuclear energy is a false solution. So um, just last year, at the end of last year, um, President Biden, he, he 
called for, he basically committed to triple nuclear energy development by 2050. So they, so people still think nuclear energy is going to save us from climate change. And, and so the United States, um, the International Atomic Energy Agency, all these entities. So last year at COP, at the convening of parties in Dubai, um, Biden announced this, that he, him and 21 other countries, so 22 countries, um, you know, they want to triple their nuclear energy through various means. I mean, we could talk about that if people have questions about SMRs and stuff like that. But, you know, how do you power nuclear energy? You know, it's it's uranium. Uranium is the fuel for energy and weapons. And so um, that was in November. And then in December, um, the United States passed what's called the well, part of this thing called the Nuclear Defense Authorization Act, there was this thing inside of there called the Nuclear Fuel Security Act, which was basically to support more uranium development. Um, the good thing is there's no budget with that. So that's great for us, but it's still this incentive that, you know, the United States is pushing for domestic energy development or whatever. And so um, later in, you know, right right around the time the mine started earlier this month, uh, the price of uranium, it's just been going up and up and up. It started going up last, um, I forget my years or time is going fast, but whenever whenever Russia invaded Ukraine and all of this stuff started happening, the price of uranium started going up. And so we have been buying the, um, uh, we have been buying old warheads from Russia and that's what we've been using to fuel our nuclear energy. The uranium that comes out of Pinyon Plain is not even that potent. I mean, compared to uranium that would come from Canada or Australia or other places. So like, just to give you an idea, it's like less than 1% uranium. And the very first uranium that was mined, well, I don't know if it was the first uranium, but the first use of uranium in an atomic weapon was taken out of this mine in, in what's today the Democratic Republic of the Congo or DRC. So a mine in called Shinkolobwe uranium mine was where they took uranium for the first nuclear bombs. That The first one was dropped in New Mexico, the Trinity test, and then um, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. That uranium was 65% uranium. And it was just super, super powerful and still left, you know, contamination all over um, today, you know, still there's places contaminated by the Manhattan Project. So anyways, going back to Pinyon Plain, it, that's not to say it's not dangerous. I mean, every, any amount of uranium poses a risk because uranium is an alpha emitter. So there's different kinds of radiation. And so every time uranium um, decays, it changes. So like, you know, the half-life, uh, you guys all learned this in school. I hope <laughs> when something is radioactive and then it reaches the half-life, you know, it's like half of it's gone and then it turns into something else. So every time uranium decays, it turn, it when it changes, it releases energy. And, and, and uranium releases alpha. And, and so there's alpha, beta, gamma. So there's a lot of different radiation that comes with uranium, um, but the most dangerous is alpha because alpha is a little particle, beta, it's like waves, gamma, waves. Um, beta is interesting, but anyways, the point is if you inhale an alpha particle um, or like some, if you just happen by chance to inhale some radioactive particle, that's that's almost a guaranteed, you know, health effect. Who knows how long down the road? It's basically a carcinogen stuck in your body forever, emitting radiation. Depending on, you know, that it's 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 really scary if you think about it, but the easiest thing you can do is just put on a face mask, you know. So so alpha can be stopped by a sheet of paper, by your skin. So alpha can't get through your skin. Um, it can't get through a mask. So so whenever you're, you know, this is something for folks to know is how to protect themselves. But if you live at these places, like the folks in Cameron, you know, 
they're exposed all the time because of the past mining. That's a different situation. Uh, there's a lot of different health effects that have been identified through, um, let's say, the Radiation Exposure Compensation Act, which is a federal law that compensates people for uranium sicknesses. I'm not a health expert. I'm not a I'm not a doctor, but um, somebody asked in the chat to go over the uh, some of the health impacts. There's a lot. I mean, if you're acutely exposed, let's say, like from a nuclear bomb, you know, that's, you you will probably die, you know, from the radiation um, or the blast, but, but long, like low dose, low, low levels of exposure over a long-term period of time, like living there, that can also um, have impacts um, like on Navajo Nation. There's, there's talk, there's a lot of anecdotal talks and then there's, you know, scientifically proven stuff. So, oh, I'm answering that question and I didn't even go back to the slide. So let me just wrap up with, uh, there's a lot of health studies that have proven autoimmune disease. Um, you know, women have had miscarriages. Right now they're finding high levels of uranium in the urine of newborn babies around Navajo Nation. So um, yeah, I can give you some other examples or uh, sources where you can find more information, but just to wrap up my presentation, um, so going back to, I, I just caught that question and then I kind of went off track, but um, I'm going to finish this. And then if you have more questions, you can put them in the chat and um, I'll, I'll try to get to them. Or I don't know if you if you all just blurt them out or however you want to do that. But um, yeah, so the last slide is basically to tell folks why nuclear is not a solution to climate change. And that's because, um, well... This is this is an infographic that shows uranium, how, how you get from the fuel, from taking out uranium out of the ground and then to the nuclear power plant. So, I mean, you start with the extraction and I mentioned ISL. There's, there's basically two different kinds of ways to take it out. And depending, you know, depending how you take it out, you essentially want to consult, you want to concentrate the uranium, however you get to that point. Um, at a mill, you would get, you would end up with um, yellow cake. And then just, just to note every step of the mine, every step of the process, starting at the mine, going to the mill, um, they all produce radioactive waste. So you start with the uranium extraction, you start to process it, because when you take the rock out, there's just a little bit of uranium, and then the rest is all radioactive dirt, basically waste rock. Um, at the mill, you concentrate it using a lot of water and chemicals and to store the waste, even you need water. There's a lot of water used at the mill is my point. So after you get the yellow cake, there's different steps of um, conversion, enrichment, deconversion. Um, I'm not a nuclear physicist, but um, the, in the enrichment process is important to note. We have an enrichment facility in New Mexico. Um, yeah, there's there's a few, I guess. I don't know. I mean, I think it's the only commercial one, but this is where essentially the level of enrichment would determine if the uranium is used in a nuclear power plant or if it would go you know, into nuclear weapons. So that's important for folks to know. So whenever, whenever you hear about stuff in the news about like e Iran and, oh, we don't know how much they're enriching their uranium to. So if it's like, I think 3.5% to 20%, depending what kind of fuel, that's for power plants. And then above that is, I mean, I don't know all the numbers. I'm not trying to make nuclear weapons, but that that's what happens at the enrichment plant. So just to explain that part to you. And then after that, you get the uranium and you want to put it in little pellets. And um, one second, let me grab this thing. So this is a, it's just a science, like a school kind of school thingy. It's the size of my pinky, like the tip of my pinky. So this is a uranium pellet. This is a, a thing they give out to encourage kids for STEM and stuff like that. So this little tiny thing, once you concentrate you know, all the uranium, it says this will equal three barrels of oil, one ton of coal. But the thing they leave out 
is all of the radioactive waste, all of the, the water that's contaminated and all of that. They don't count that when, when they're showing you, you know, this little pellet. So then you make the, you make the uh, fuel rod, you put the little pellets in there, and then those fuel rods, those go into a nuclear power plant. And, and then that's what causes the nuclear reaction and makes the turbine spin. Um, basically, a nuclear power plant is just the most expensive way to boil water. And it, it emits, uh, I, I'll show you in a minute, but yeah, so, so the nuclear power plant, very expensive, takes a long time, emits radiation and other stuff. And then the waste that's generated, this is called high level radioactive waste. It's um, basically radioactive forever and it needs to be contained forever. It needs to be contained from the environment and, and away from life, humans and all life. So these containers, depending, depending on the quality may last 20 years. So just imagine these containers, you're gonna have to recontain them. Is that a word? Recontainerize them every 20 years. And, and and they don't do that every 20 years. So maybe till after they're cracked and things like that. So keep in mind, nuclear power plants, they're generally licensed for about 30 years, perhaps maybe to start with. And so some of them starting in the 70s, if they're still running now, you know, this is 60 years, 50 years down the road, they're old. A lot of the nuclear power plants are old. They should be shut down. They they they're they have too much waste on site. You know, it's not safe how they store them. They need a lot of water to store them. So what does this mean for Palo Verde? You know, you guys have a power plant in the desert and the best shielding from radiation is water. Um, so I know Palo Verde uses sewage water. So I'm just curious about, you know, there's a lot of issues with water and water scarcity and then like during climate change and Phoenix, to begin with, takes a lot of water, you know, from Navajo Nation through the cap. Um, the, the I'm, I mean, I don't work on those issues. I don't know all of the water rights and things like that. But essentially, if the Grand Canyon is contaminated, there's a lot of people downstream that are going to be impacted in California, probably um, Phoenix, Las Vegas. Anyway, so going back to this slide. So the reason why nuclear is not... Um, carbon is not a solution to climate change is because they say it's carbon free or carbon neutral because they only count the carbon footprint at the nuclear power plant. So basically the only thing emitted at the power plant is a lot of steam, radiation and heat. So a lot of thermal heat is generated because it's, it's literally hot. So it's radioactive, hot, radioactively hot, and then hot, you know, like hot, hot. They don't count the all of this stuff, which which is transported all over the world. That all of that is fueled by fossil fuels. The transportation, of course, also fossil fuels. And then right now, there's nowhere to store this stuff, and so they also don't count, you know, the impact of the waste and 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 a lot of the um, how, how how do we deal with this? How do we count the carbon footprint of that? But really, the carbon footprint of this, you know, being forever, how, how do we manage that as humans? Um, so we have 80,000 metric tons, maybe I think 85 or more now. The last time I looked, it was a lot of metric tons that we don't have anywhere to put it. So we need to stop making nuclear waste. We need to stop making nuclear weapons. Um, and, and that brings me to question, what what is the uranium going to be used for it in or, at, at Pinyon Plain, what is energy fuels going to do with it? I don't know. I don't. We don't know where it's going to go. Um, we don't know what it's for. They just just did a presentation. Energy, not energy fuels. The Forest Service did a presentation, um, and they're saying it's a small deposit, and they're only going to mine for 28 months. Um, so if it's such a small deposit and it's very low grade, um, not the best quality, you know, I, I don't see what's the point of mining it. We don't need uranium to survive, you know, we can't eat it. We can't use it for shelter, things like that. So it's 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 purely in my perspective to maintain United States imperialism and control of the rest of the world. Again, using our resources, um, taking from indigenous peoples for, you know, basically this uh, neoliberal 
control to to continue. Um, so I I don't know. That's kind of where I'm going to end the presentation. I think uh, there's a lot to be said about the, the capitalism and all of the the issues that you know are are creating this mess. And I don't know. It's 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 a lot to fight. So <laughs> we're dealing with our federal our tribal government internally, but maybe all of you can help more at the state level. Um, yeah, so there's other things that can happen, I'm sure. And then, of course, at the end of the day, um, one of our co-founders strongly believed in direct action. Um, and that's still a, a big question mark, uh, what to do with that one. So I'm not, I'm just going to leave that open there. But yeah, there's like a good nine minutes for some questions. What happens when a power, when a power plant retires? Well, they get a lot of money from the federal government from this thing called the decommissioning fund. So right now, um, when a power plant is being decommissioned, they basically just um, they close it, and then there's they they right now they just keep the waste in these big containers. So like they call it uh, parking lot dumps. So they put it on a concrete pad. So like you'll drive by some power plants and you'll just see these big casks sitting outside the power plant. So they call it dry storage. They take it out of the wet cooling pools and then they put the fuel rods in dry storage and then it's just sitting there. And and that, you know, that's a, a target for, you know, some malicious activity that could happen and that could be very dangerous. So they, we, in, in, in our... I'm an anti-nuke. I call myself an anti-nuclear activist or whatever agitator. Um, so there's a lot of little terms we have like mobile Chernobyl. So the idea if they put those on the railroad, because that was what they were going to do was transport them, you know, that could be a mobile Chernobyl. It could have a major, you know, it could, it could there could be a major accident if one of those were to blow up, catch on fire, and then the radioactive particles, you know, get ex exploded and spread all over a wide area. That was the worst case scenario we were concerned about. So we stopped that one, but there's still a hundred and just over a hundred reactors in the country that all need to be fully decommissioned, have the power plants taken apart, have the waste taken care of um, and, and do that forever. So because there's nowhere to put it right now, some states are saying, well, let's take it Let's control it ourselves. Let's not dump it on New Mexico. Let's make jobs out of it and we'll guard it ourselves. And so there's some states trying to put money to it to, to keep the waste. Um, there's some states like where they put their power plants right along the ocean. And because of uh, climate change, they're losing the coastal land. So, so the salty air is getting closer to those metal containers and that can be really dangerous too. The worst case scenario is in um, San Diego at a San Onofre. They just put out a movie about this um, called SOS. There, the containers are about a hundred feet from the ocean. And so they're trying to move them inland. So the big fight was, let's, let's move them far away. Let's take them to New Mexico. And so we were like, no, no, we don't want them in New Mexico. So, so now they're trying to move them a thousand feet inland. So this is the best we can do <laughs> with the most dangerous stuff in the world. But um, yeah, I don't know if there's more questions, if that answers your questions, if you're, if that answered your question. Yeah, so they don't, they put trillions into nuclear weapons, they put billions into nuclear power, and um, it produces like in the U.S. about 20% of our electricity in France, um, EDF, um, they make, I think it's about 80% nuclear energy. But here, yeah, um, it's really sad because there was this thing called the Radiation Exposure Compensation Act. That's money that the federal government has for people that got hurt mining. And then some people that were hurt from nuclear bomb tests. Um, it didn't include the people from the Trinity test, the first test. So those people here in New Mexico, they lobbied really hard and, and we got the closest, well, we, they, they worked with, um, Sen uh, for, with our, uh, Congressman ba Ben Ray Wuhan, um, and they, they were able to get, um, well, let me, let me back up a little bit. So RICA was started in 1990 and was supposed to sunset in 2022, and so this is a fund that people need for their health care. 
and 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 so in 2022 they got an extension a two-year extension just a little band-aid but people like at the trinity site um they wanted rika to expand to include not just them but other downwinders and then also rika doesn't include anybody past 1971 so so you know there's a lot of nuclear workers who were also hurt after 1971 so this RICA expansion, you know, they're trying to include post-71 uranium workers, Trinity downwinders, and more, and extend it longer. So that almost passed through Congress, and then at the 11th hour, it was yanked. Again, that was an attachment to the National Defense Authorization Act. So while the United States is funding more waste, I mean, more mess making more waste it doesn't fund cleanup there's no funding for cleanup of those 20,000 abandoned mines and they just cut the funding well let me let me rephrase that rika still has uh until july so so there was an extension for 2 years but that's going to end in july so they have a few months to try to pass something through congress so i don't know if anyone knows what that's like to get something through Congress. Um, I think it's more possible to stop Pinion Plain uran uranium mine, and 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 some people are saying it, it it might take an act of Congress to stop Pinion Plain. So right now we're just focusing on the governor, and we want folks to 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 send letters to the governor, and then also for indigenous folks, we also are asking different tribes to to put out official statements. So like the Havasupai did their statement, Navajo Nation did a statement. We're hoping that we'll get a statement from Hopi, um, maybe some of the other tribes. I don't know if um, any of them, especially around Oak Flat, I know they're dealing with that. So maybe some of the Apaches, but that's where we're at is still just building resistance against the mine. Um, as of now, we know the mine has, um, they've been taking out a lot of waste rock um, but we have no clue if or when they will reach the uranium that they want. Right now, they've only reached what they call low-grade uranium. So they're trying to get to the high-grade uranium. And then once they have enough, I guess, I'm imagining when they feel like they have enough, they'll start transporting it. But um, it's a long way to transport. And yeah, I'm curious about, someone was mentioning, you know, is it even you know how much the, the the expense of gas and everything you know how much are they actually making once they get to the mill but anyways yeah i don't know if there's any more questions um yeah so i don't see any more questions and i know it's about about seven o'clock hey, thank you leona I, I i had i had a question um do you have an idea like what, what is the average lifespan of, of a mine or at least for opinion mine this one, they said 28 months. Wow. So not that long. And so they they got like, they were licensed in 1986. Um, and so essentially they, you know, how long is, is that? 1986, it's like 30, seven years. I don't know. And so they finally started, but these companies, they just hold on to their assets until the price is really high. So they will wait it out until the, like, again, I was saying the price of, of uranium was over a hundred dollars a pound. So um, the life of the mine, you know, after they get their uranium out, they will take forever to clean up. So some mines, sometimes they go on standby and this is so that they can, keep the mine open and wait for the price to go back up. And then they, they're just like not cleaning up, but what should happen? I mean, the mine is, is, is dug. They, they should close it and, and start to clean it up. So this is what we're saying is they, they need to start the cleanup, which, you know, when you look at the abandoned mines I was talking about, um, if they don't have a responsible party, those can take a long time. Though, I mean, some people have been have been waiting, gosh, since the the eighties, you know, for cleanup. 
um, right now, energy fuels would be the responsible party. So yeah, I think that's the other thing is um, the mine needs to close. And then how how do they do, how do they close it? And then what is responsible cleanup? So that is is the is what we're asking for is post mining, um, post closure activities. So shut it down, close it, and then start to clean it up. But um, so yeah, what actions can people take to support stopping the mine? Right now, um, Hall No has always had a two pronged approach. So we always had this action side, action component, and then a policy component. So on the policy side, we're just dealing with um, putting pressure on Governor Hobbs. Um, there was someone here. I think they left the the the, the Zoom. I was going to ask them to post a link. Um, I know there's some organizations that have um, some some sign on letters, and then some organizations are going to uh, put some some uh, like easy easy uh, letters that easy websites where you can sign a letter and then it goes to the governor. So I know that's going to happen soon, but right now, yeah, I don't, I don't have that handy. I'm sorry. I should have, I should have had that ready to go. But um, right now we sent a letter to, to the governor uh, from 90 different groups. And so we're asking for a meeting with her. I don't, that's still in the works. Um, so yeah, I think any pressure folks can put, on the governor or to help educate others. Um, right now in Arizona, I think the key target is really just the governor. If folks know other people, the the Forest Service has done a lousy job in, in, in dealing with the mine. So we're not even dealing with the Forest Service or AZDEQ. Um, so AZDEQ, Arizona Department of Environmental Quality, um, they're supposed to be regulating, and then the Forest Service calls themselves landlords. It's within Forest Service lands, so it's public lands. Anyone can go to the mine. Anyone can just drive up and see it. I mean, that's what we do. We just drive right up, take pictures, um, walk around, talk to the workers. None of the workers have uh, protective coverings over their face. Um yeah, so right now the the roads are really muddy and they're having a hard time, you know, getting out. So we don't know when the transport will start. So that's the other thing is um, the transport route from the mine coming down to I-40 and then to Flag. We don't know. I don't know if those communities are aware of this. Hall No is Diné led. So our crew is mostly Diné and we're like really focusing on that. Navajo Nation um, component, talking to chapter officials, Navajo EPA, putting pressure on our president. And that's our focus as Diné people. We've always been focused on the transport route, as, as you can tell from our name. Um, but this is Havasupai land, and then the mill is on Ute lands. And there's a lot of non-natives, non-native communities. And I think um, I have no clue where those non-native communities are at. Like, Williams, Vale, Tucson, do they know? I mean, there's, there is, oh, cool. Thanks for the Sierra Club petition. Yeah, there's, there, there's some different things that are going to be coming out. Hall, no, <laughs> we're not doing any of those because Sierra Club has one. Grand Canyon Trust has, I think, a petition to Biden. Um, Arizona Wild is going to do the letter. So we have all these different, these different NGOs doing stuff. What we recommend, what we're what we're asking for, is people to take autonomous action. What does that mean? Um, so, we as Hall know are a small indigenous volunteer group. We don't have the capacity to, as I as I call it, we we can't orchestrate this huge you know kind of thing. We we are only able to deal with our own communities right now, like I said, we're focusing on Navajo and we we're asking folks to to take part of the fight, do do whatever folks can do. I mean, if you can educate your school, maybe your church, get your church to send a letter to the governor or your school or whatever. Um, there's also been, uh, you know, we've we've had a lot of talk about action. 
right now we're still looking into a lot of the um know your rights know your risks kind of thing for people actually taking direct action um we are concerned if 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 anything would happen on the hall route um especially if people are trying to do resistance actions and things like that um but we're also just concerned i think mostly for contamination and accidents that's that's the main thing we're 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 wanting to avoid is more contamination so we're really trying to stop the mine before any transport happens and right now we're asking the governor to change the, the the status of the mining permit and so that's where we're at but because of 1872 mining law and other things there's a lot of limitations um and it's going to take i don't know it's going to take a lot of pressure i think it's going to take a lot of not just from people and, and groups, but from, I, I would say, from other governments. So, like, even the city of Flagstaff, um, they signed a resolution or a, a, some kind of statement opposing the transport, but even they don't have jurisdiction to stop the transport through the city of Flagstaff. It's only a mile that goes through on Country Club, less than a mile, I think. But, yeah, because of the interstate commerce and all of the U.S. highway stuff, um, so we have different lawyers looking into this. I know the Navajo Nation's looking into it. Um, but there's other, <laughs> the other thing that would stop it is probably a buyout. So if, if anyone just had like a ton of money to buy out the company, and that, that, I mean, honestly, they probably would make more money in a buyout than trying to mine their little bits of uranium dust. But um, yeah, so I don't know. There's a, there, For now, that's where we're at is explaining what's going on, educating folks um, and any kind of pressure folks can put on the governor, putting, you know, letters to the editor out in, in the different newspapers. I don't know if folks do projections <laughs> on, on the big government buildings downtown in Phoenix, um, things that get attention, I think, are important. Um yeah, writing writing about it, I think, is important. Um, but getting for me, I'm I'm asking folks to get government government statements. I think there's a lot more creative solutions. I think people can do other things that I'm not even aware of right now because I'm just so stuck in this, you know, area of of the governor and and the Navajo Nation politics of uh, trying to get the governor, the president, to do something. But I think people, we need more people to go to the mine, but there are radioactive emissions. So we don't want, I mean, I'm laughing now because before they started mining, you know, we didn't think about it. Now they're actually mining. So we want, you know, people to be cautious. Um, we need help monitoring the mine. You know, with that said, we need people to actually go there and help us to take pictures. Um, we're going to start doing radiation readings if people are able to do water or soil samples. This is something that we're also talking about. So just a lot of different things that we're working on. I don't know if people know how to do um, movies, make, make, you know, making a short film about the story. You know, I'm not good at social media personally. That's not my forte. So yeah, that's where we're at. I'll just stop talking for a minute and see if that's it. <laughs> Thank, thank you, Leona. Um, I, I did want to share, I, I know Sandy from Sierra Club was here earlier. Many of us are familiar with Sandy. Um, and, and Sierra Club here in Arizona led on that that led on one of many letters to, to uh, Governor Hobbs and Chispa did sign on. And, and for the Chispa members on, I just want you all to know, like, like this is one way that we use our, our communal group power, right, is uh, we sign on to letters like this on behalf of our members. We say, hey, we have uh, close to 300 members uh, from from the community here in Arizona, and and they're asking uh, they're asking that that you hear the call of the the the, the tribes that are asking you to to do this. So um, just know that that that, that just by being a CISPA member, you're participating in that way. Um, uh, we'll continue to push Sierra Club's uh, sign on letter. Julian shared that it it took less than a minute to to sign. So the link's there in the chat, and we'll continue to push it out. One thing you all can do is, is, is sign that and then send it, you know, talk to just one person. If everybody here at, at our peak, we were at 30, 38 people in here. So if everybody goes and talks to, to one more person, that's that's an additional almost 40 people that we can get to sign on and send a letter to, to Governor Hobbs uh, advocating for this. Um, 
Let me see, I'm going to share my screen. Uh, so, um, also wanted to just, just name that uh, one of the... One of the oh, one quería of, nombrar... Oh. Um, What what one of one of the the laws that was mentioned right the eighteen seventy two mining law I just want to take this time to call that out too that 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 the mining law that that governs how mines are set up and claims are are acted on uh, was created in eighteen seventy two like Arizona wasn't even a, a state then you know and the law was set up to encourage people to mine they they wanted people to 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 settle to colonize the, the West. So they, they 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 set up this law, you know, to to encourage, uh, to 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 barely regulate, if at all, you're right, uh, how how mines were were enacted, what the responsibility be, would be to to clean up afterwards, and so th this law needs to be reformed. And uh, here in Arizona, actually, uh, down in Tucson, uh, uh, Congressman Grijalva has been a big leader on, on pushing and calling for a reform of that law. Um, so that that's another way that that we can take action is is to continue to support uh, um, folks who are leading campaigns like that. Uh, again, Chispa, if you're a member, we we keep you up to date on some of these actions and some of these ways that you can get involved. We just had Environmental Lobby Day at the state capitol, right? That that was a, a great way for us to raise some of these issues uh, issues to our our uh, uh, Congress people here. Yes, yeah, so we have a Clean Air and Energy uh, Committee. Our public lands committee and a democracy committee, and these are our membership-led opportunities. So these these are opportunities for our members to, to decide and, and pick projects that they want to support and use Chispa resources, whether that's our access to uh, uh, elected officials or uh, funding, right, or our social media. Whatever we have is available to our members to use uh, in any way that they would like. And so this past weekend, we actually had tons of activity. We had our Clean Air and Energy uh, Committee. Uh, host a off-grid solar workshop. So folks came, we had almost 40 people attend and learn how to set up an off-grid solar system. Um, and, and so you can see a picture here of, of people setting that up and, and learning hands-on. Um, uh, the week before, folks went out to, to a museum to learn a little bit more about uh, the indigenous history of, of, of this land and uh, get some hands-on experiences there. Um, coming up are, uh, let's see, our public lands committee has uh, uh, volunteered to support uh, our Hualapai relatives who are organizing a run to bring awareness and uh, advocate uh, against a lithium mine that is being set up in Wikiup, Arizona. So Wikiup is where the screen stars at on the map. It's just west of Pres Prescott. Um, there's a, 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 a spring there, a hot spring, that uh, is, is, is sacred water is considered sacred by by several tribes and they use it medicinally and ceremonially, and um, there there there's a current exploration to set up a lithium mine that would threaten that water. And so not only is that water considered sacred, but that water also feeds into uh, the Colorado River and several other rivers that contribute to our drinking water here in Phoenix. Uh, so the elders up there were, were asking that we remind people down here in Phoenix that this, this fight is also our fight because this is water that, that would impact us as well. Um, so so uh, in March, they're gonna be organizing a prayer run from uh, Peach Springs Reservation down to Wikiup. And uh, eventually it'll end up uh, at the state capitol on March 19th from one to four o'clock. But the uh, the Public Lands Committee is, is collectively working to support that effort. So. Um, if you're looking to, to get more more involved and find ways, or if you have an idea for a project and you just want to want some support and, and what the next steps are, whether it's a letter writing campaign, right, or or creating a, a, a video for social media that explains an issue that you think needs to be, uh, we, we need to have more education on, right? The, the committees are there for, for you all uh, to take part in and, and to, to navigate and, and, and uh, or organize and learn some new skills, right? So you don't have to go in and be an expert. You don't have to be a super activist, right? You just have to care. And if you show up, uh, the, the committee, our, our other members, right, will work collectively and we'll figure out some solutions and some ways for all of us to get involved. Um, ad additionally, right, some 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 upcoming dates. Uh, we have four monthly events that we host. Uh, if you're looking to connect with, with Chispa and, uh, and other members, if you're trying to bring out a, a friend and get them involved, these are some good ways to introduce people to to this space, right? And uh, one, one of those is our gardening sessions 
with, with Blanca. She hosts them every first and second Sunday at Spaces of Opportunity. So that's going to be the 4th and the 18th of February from 9 to 11. We also host a community hike uh, once a month. It's usually the, the second Saturday of the month. In February, we're actually going to be, uh, we're going to run a van and we're going to uh, offer to transport folks who would like to go up to Oak Flat. And Oak Flat, uh, the Apache stronghold and, and several other uh, other uh, tribes and, and communities have been fighting for years now um, to prevent uh, um, expansion of copper mining in Oak Flat that would decimate a, a, whole, a whole mountain, right? And, and, and that land too is considered sacred and it was used ceremonially and so there, there's a there's a, a prayer run there February 15th to the 18th uh we're going to be taking folks up on the 17th so February 17th uh we'll probably head out here I think around 10 or 11 but uh, again if you're interested in that just just uh follow us on, on Instagram we'll, we'll be posting more about that um we have a river cleanup that we do uh it's usually the third Saturday of the month uh, this month we this month we moved it to the 24th, but uh, that's an opportunity to clean up the river, uh, sp spend some time outdoors from eight to ten. Uh, all these events are family friendly, right? Uh, and then uh, our community circle. So this is a, a community healing space where you can come together and engage in in a, a, a type of communal therapy together, a, a talking circle, if you will. Uh, that's the fourth Thursday of the month, and so. Uh, these events are open to the public. You don't have to be a member. We ask that you do become a member so, you, so we can keep you in the loop on all that we have going on. Uh, and also remember, if you're a member, you can join our, our committees, our comités. Um, to become a member, you can you can check out uh, chispaarizona.org or our Instagram uh, in the bio. We have our, our link uh, to how to become a member. Uh, you can always call me too if you have any questions, DJ. Uh, my phone number is here. If you have any questions or you would like to be plugged in to a committee and you're not already and you're a CHISPA member, or if you would like to be a CHISPA member, you can also give me a call as well. So um, again, we want to thank Leona for, for uh, her time and sharing this, this knowledge with us. I hope that uh, everyone feels uh, inspired to, to take action and to, and to support this issue. Um, just wanted to open up the floor one last time to see if anybody had any last uh, thoughts or, or, or questions before we head out. And if you could also, since Opele posted a survey in the chat for um, just their services and providing translation. So if you could complete that as well, uh, just so they, they can uh, better shape their services. All right, y'all. Well, we appreciate your time. We thank you for showing up. Um, knowledge is the first step to taking action, right? Um, so so we we thank everybody. Again, thank you, Leona, and Sotele, um, and, and everyone who showed up today. Uh, this this recording will be available on our YouTube. Uh, again, we'll, we'll, we keep everybody uh, up to date, usually through Instagram or Facebook or our email list. So make sure you're, you're connected to one of those, and you'll get notified when we put out the, the YouTube video. All right, everybody. Good night.